Hola, welcome to another Julia Smooth Optimizers tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to be talking about callbacks. So I have already prepared the, the packages that we're going to be using today. We're going to be using jump to define our model and NLP models jump to integrate it with our solvers. And we're going to be using the solvers from JSO solvers and the solver Percival. And also we're going to be plotting and we always want linear algebra loaded because we might eventually use it. Uh, these are the versions of the packages. So you can check if you have the latest uh, version. And if something is not working and you have the correct versions, please let us know, open an issue or send us a message on Zulip or Discourse. Okay, so to investigate our, our callbacks, we're going to be using the extended Rosenbrock function. So the extended Rosenbrock function is this one down here. So just a reminder that this is the Rosenbrock function or some variation of it. And this here is one of the possible extensions that we can make, which is essentially just uh, duplicate or um, replicate this for every pair of uh, odd and even variable. Uh, and we change these four to larger numbers. Uh, so it becomes a little bit harder for the solver uh, when n increases. Uh, especially because these variables are essentially, uh, these terms are independent from one another, so otherwise it will be essentially the same always. Okay, let's implement that. I'm going to create a let and um, block. I'm going to create, I'm going to be using n equals something like 5. I'm going to create variables 1 to n. Um, 1 to 2 n, actually. And my objective is to minimize the sum of x to i minus 1 minus 1 squared plus 2i squared times 2i minus 2i minus 1 squared squared. And this sum is for i equals 1 to n. Okay, this is our, our problem. Our NLP is just this math, waiting for the autocomplete, math of NLP model of the model. Now this is an NLP model, so it's a JSO compliant model, okay? So you can see here that it has 10 variables, all three. And this, uh, this NLP model can be passed to any of our solvers that works for a unconstrained uh, problem, which I think are most of them or all. Uh, for instance, we can just do um, trunk of NLP. And first order stationary, but you can actually print the output and see more information. Like the solution is a lot of ones, the objective value is essentially zero, and the dual feasibility is good up to the the default values, which are ten to the minus eight. So we can change the this to be ten to the minus four, for instance if we want more something a little bit looser we don't want to change these values now but uh, just in case we want to do it um okay so this is traditional usage of our solvers you just create a, a problem you solve the problem and you can uh, investigate uh, the output uh, through these variables what we're going to be doing is creating a callback. And a callback is just a function that has three arguments, NLP, solver, and stats. And this should be begin. And this function uses these three arguments in whatever way you want, essentially. So the NLP is our problem, our NLP. Our solver, in this case, is going to be trunk. And the stats are the things that are returned here at the end. These, of course, include all of these uh, that you're seeing here. It also includes things that are solver specific when the solver has something specific. I believe that trunk has nothing specific. 
this is just a traditional unconstrained things so uh what kind of things can i change or investigate in the callback you can look at the help of the solver so if you go to the live docs here in pluto you can look for callback and you're gonna see what the solver has available so there's some information here about status being user we're gonna talk a little bit more about that but more important now we can investigate solver.x to investigate the current iterate or the gradient or we can look at stats.duofees for the norm of the current gradient iter the objective etc okay so we have a few interesting things to look at uh, one thing that we can do is log or uh, maybe debug uh, the classical debugging experience of just printing everything so if i want to check the objective at every iteration i can just print that objective uh, and for it to actually work we're gonna pass the callback to our server so trunk nlp callback equals cb we run it and you can see here the server is printing the information that we want okay you don't actually need to do this of course i i hope that you know you can just say verbose equals one and you're actually gonna have a log uh it doesn't fit very well here in pluto but it shows the function the the dual feasibility and some specific information about the solver uh, but yeah, you could log in a different way if you want. Okay, now to a more interesting example. Let's say you actually want to plot a history of uh, of your objectives. So I'm going to create a variable here, fHistory, which is going to be uh, float64 brackets, which is an empty array of float64. And I'm going to push all of our uh, objectives into that after everything is done i'm gonna plot f3 and up here you can see the, fun the objective function okay so just like that you can actually store the objective function and print it you could actually do this uh, like you could actually put the plotting inside the callback but because of the way that Pluto works this doesn't actually work here but if you do it on VS Code for instance you can you can do that I'm not sure if that's a great idea unless you have a really slow uh, problem and that doesn't really uh, uh, get hurt by plotting every iteration but uh, if you have something that's really big and you want to check the iteration every time something like a deep neural network i don't know it might be useful to plot continuously in our case we just want to do some useful uh, information a posteriori and this can also be useful for classes right so one thing that i usually like to do for for classes is to plot the the trace of the algorithm so here I can say that X, this is a terrible way of doing this, by the way, but that's okay. Stats dot, well, actually, sober dot X, one, two. And if I did this correctly, X should be, well, it is not. Uh, yeah, X prima, so X prime. Uh, you can do this and see the iterations. And now you can do something interesting like uh, plotting uh, the contour of our function. Of course, in this case, our function is has more variables, more than two variables. So it's not exactly the best thing to do, but you can do something like... So here uh, you can do the contour plots of just the two first variables and keep the other uh, uh, 2n minus 2 variables fixed. Uh, I'm using obj, which is from the NLP models API. So we actually had to load the NLP models API. And here you can see the contour plots. Um, I'm gonna add a few more levels, like a hundred. 
and I can scatter plot the X all rows, columns one and two. Uh, I can actually plot this and, and set the marker to three and line to arrow. So I think this is usually what I do. Uh, more color usually ensure, ensures. So you can see here, starting from zero, it moves this way until it gets to the solution. Okay. Of course, this is not exactly what's happening because it's multivariate. And anyway, if you're just doing for n equals one, it should work. This is exactly what's happening because now we only have two variables. Okay. So this is how trunk works for this problem. Um, but yeah, anyway, this is one example of the things you can do with callbacks for plotting or logging purposes. Okay, now let's look at something a little bit different. Uh, our servers usually don't check for the number of iterations, uh, essentially because we don't feel like it's a valid comparison. Some solvers use second order information in one iteration, some solvers don't. So if you just say, I, I use one iteration for the solver, it's not really comparable. So we don't usually use that as a stopping criteria. We prefer to use max eval, which is the number of uh, functions evaluations. But let's say that you do want to use the maximum number of iterations because you know what you're doing with your solver and you prefer that uh, stopping criteria. How can you implement that using callbacks? And that's really simple. Uh, what you have to check is the number of iterations. So that's available in stats dot iter right so you can see here and what you want to do is set the status of the stats uh, to user so if stat dot iter is greater than 10 for instance you say that stats dot status is user user okay so this Remove this. We'll say that this is a user. Uh, this is a user requested uh, stop. So you can run here, and here it is user requested stopped. It did eleven iterations, which is greater than ten, and stopped it. Okay. You can do something a little bit more uh, specific. So if you know that your objective function will be closer to zero you can say well if it's less than 10 to the minus six you can already stop that's also uh, another use for it. It, it well it was exactly 11 iterations again and there's something like uh, minus 10 so here 12 iterations 11 it was not it was 10 to the minus 9 now it is 10 to the minus 12 so we stop another stopping criteria that sometimes people want to do is to verify that the uh, the objective is stalling that can also be done here you can say f old equals uh something like one i don't know and if well, let's just create a new variable it's not expensive uh if the difference is you can use something like this so if the difference is, is too small like relatively less than 10 to the minus 4 stop and remember to update f old here same thing now we got like super small just maybe not so useful like 0 0.1 yeah okay that's now terrible Well, you only have two options, either too little or too much. So in our case, the objective function doesn't get stalled. So I'm going to shit a little bit and make it bad. So I can do something like stats. Uh, so solver.gx. So this is the actual gradient. I'm going to use dot x equal 0 0.01. So remember that the, uh, this is the same as over.gx times 001. The dot is necessary here because we don't want to change this uh, pointer. Yes. 
I want to change the inner values of GX. We don't use the dot here. It doesn't actually change GX. It just creates this variable uh, pointing to another thing. So it doesn't work. So remember to use the dot. So I'm just slowing down the iterations now. The gradients are much smaller. And uh, yeah, now it's slow. I was just running it. So let's use 10 to the minus 4. Uh, yeah, now it's actually too slow and it broke down. So let's use 0 0.1 maybe. Yeah, it's, it still breaks down. But you got the idea. Um, good, this works. If you use 0 0.1, we can say variables equals 1 to check that the objective value is stalling here in this column. 0.9 to 0.6. So around... 175 if it gets small and decreases very very slowly so 1.3 1.3 1.3 gets to the point that it says okay uh the objective function is stalling All right so it's an easy way to implement this remember to not break the actual uh trunk method so this is an easy way to implement this uh, function stalling uh, and if you want to do any kind of check, anything at all, you can just use this uh, output status dot, uh, equals user. Okay? If you set this, it will stop the next iteration. Okay, so the callbacks are implemented to most of our solvers, so the JSO solvers, yes, but also Percival, you can look at Percival to Percival, but since Percival is a constraint solver, it's, if you just call it with an unconstrained problem, it will just send it to Tron. So I'm going to create a constraint, or a few constraints actually. So let's create the constraint x2i minus 1 square, x2i square equals 1. So this is a variation, another variation of the Rosenbrock function, which you constrain the, the first two variables, or in this case, every two variables to, to be in a, uh, in a sphere, uh, in this case, in, in a two-dimensional uh, sphere, so a circle. And here you can see the solution is 0 0.79 and 0 0.61, and that's essentially the same for every two values. Uh, so Percival is a different solver, so you have different information, in particular the multipliers is new. Uh, and you also have a primal, primal feasibility, which is how much the constraints are being violated. So you can also touch those things. So one thing that we can do here is instead of log the objective we can log the primal history and the dual history so these are in stats stats dot primal no, um primal this and dual history is stats dot dual this okay and after everything is done you just plot primal history and Instead of plotting it together, let's plot dual history. Otherwise, it looks like a filter and it can also be use, useful for filter methods, I guess. But we just want to see how we progress through the time. And this was, well, it was kind of easy, so not so interesting. But one important thing to do here, that usually these values are more useful in the log scale. Yeah. So here you have it. It was just six iterations. And probably make it a little bit harder like 10 there you have it as usual you can do something like if how many iterations this was just five iterations so not a lot so let's do it let's change the arto and the ato to zero just so we don't get stuck in a loop we can set the max time to five is if it's not gonna work so this now is gonna run for five seconds so we solved the problem and then it started to oscillate possibly around the solution or a few points around the solution which is terrible 
but we can just say if the primal history sorry if the stats dot primal fees less than 10 to the minus 6 and stats dot dual fees less than 10 to the minus 6 please set a user requested stop okay and i have it back to what it was before so that's the idea of the callbacks. Uh, I think uh, all of our main solvers have a callback. The JSO solvers, uh, Percival, DCI solver, IPOPT, uh, our NLP models IPOPT also has a callback, but it's not the same callback because IPOPT itself has a callback. So you have to follow a different, uh, a different set of rules. Uh, unfortunately, that's not easy to just migrate everything uh, but yeah it also has a callback that you can follow okay please let us know if you have any questions about callbacks if you have any ideas or anything that you want to explore that is not working leave a comment or just send us a message on zulip or this course we're going to try to help you especially if you have something that you you think that should be available to the callbacks and that is not so we can think about how to make that uh, available Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.